Okay, um, <clears throat> you'll recall that last time we took a very large chunk of Acts chapter 15 looking at the Jerusalem Council, and um, we left one portion uh, un... well, we just didn't deal with it because it was an entirely different subject, so that's what we're going to pick up. This morning we want to look at Acts 15, uh, verses 33 through 41. And as I mentioned before, I, I forgot to put the title in the bulletin, and if that is important to you, the title is Division in the Ranks, and that's what we're looking at this morning, the division. So I'd like to uh, pick it up in verse 33, remembering that uh, they have now taken this letter to Antioch, they've shared this, uh, the results of the council with the church. And now we see what's, what really is the beginnings of the second missionary journey. We read, after they had spent time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace, and that is talking about the prophets that came from Jerusalem to strengthen the brethren, uh, to those who had sent them out. But it seemed good to Silas to remain there. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also, but Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Well, again, may the Lord teach us something with regard to um, uh, just how uh, dishonoring it is to him to have division but how important it is that we work through division to unity. Now, I've already mentioned that last time we were in the book of Acts, we were looking at the Jerusalem Council. Remember, some believing Jews from Jerusalem had gone to Antioch in order to compel the newly converted Gentiles to be circumcised. They believed that they needed Christ plus something else, plus the law of Moses. They were willing to add Jesus to the equation. They saw Jesus as the fulfillment of that law. He was the Messiah. But they didn't quite want to let go of the old covenant. It was still such a big part of the Jewish identity. And Paul actually tells us, remember, that they don't necessarily need to let go of it. Just when it comes to justification, they must not look to these things as a reason why God accepts them or anyone else. Now, we do need to remember that at this time, Christianity was still relatively new. Church was still working through the implications of Christ's work. And that's why the council seems to take really a rather sedate you know, stand compared to what Paul will later write to the Galatians. You know, compare what the Jerusalem Council actually concluded with what Paul says in Galatians 5, 2. If you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. In other words, if you're going to look to your works to save you, why do you need the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we saw that at the council, that after they considered what the Lord said in the Scriptures, that He was going to raise up a, a, a son of David seat him on his throne so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And after they heard the testimonies of those who had a firsthand experience with the Gentiles, that the Lord was receiving them and giving them His Holy Spirit to show that He had, they concluded that since He did it apart from circumcision and the law, that they should not place that burden, that yoke upon the necks of the new converts. They did, however, direct them to observe four things in order not to offend the Jews who lived around them, Acts 15, 20, that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. 
Now, I don't want to go into everything that we saw there. Just to remind you, the first two of these things have to do with idolatry. Uh, some commentators see fornication not as like the one moral thing in the midst of these others that are really matters of Christian liberty, but rather as something that has to do with the uncleanness, the spiritual uncleanness associated with idolatry that is not so much an issue any longer. So the first two having to do with idolatry, the second pair having to do with the dietary law. Don't eat blood. In the new covenant, these things are now matters of Christian liberty. And what the council was saying was this, don't use your liberty in Christ to offend your Jewish brethren or your Jewish neighbor that you hope to bring to Jesus. Now, again, we need to do the same thing. And that's what Paul means when he tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 31 through 33, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. Now, remember when Paul says that, he's not saying, I become immoral to the immoral person. But what he's saying is, in these matters of Christian liberty that I have, I either exercise that liberty or I don't, in such a way that I draw people to Jesus and I don't push them away. Let's make sure that we do all that we do in order to bring people to Jesus and not to drive them away from Jesus. Now Luke next turns to the events that lead up to the second missionary journey. Last time we saw Judas and Silas, prophets from the Jerusalem church, pouring the Word of God into the disciples in order to strengthen them in their pursuit of Christ-likeness. And again, remember, that's what this is all about. That's what we're all about. That's what the ministry of the Word is all about in order to make us more like Him. Now, after these brethren, except for Silas, returned to Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas continued that work, teaching and preaching the Word, along with others. And again, notice the emphasis on the Word of God. They were continually teaching it, preaching it, bathing God's people in it, pouring the Word of God into them so that they could be built up in the Lord Jesus. And that's really what we need to be doing. But let's remember, it's not all about teaching. Teaching is a means to an end. The end is action, that we actually do what it is that our Lord has called us to do. But now after some time had passed, Paul became concerned about the young converts, you know, that had come to Christ on the first missionary journey. Are they growing in Christ? How are they doing? And so he said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas agreed. You know, he also wanted to know that they were still holding fast to Jesus but we see that there was something that they also didn't agree on, and that's what we want to consider this morning. Now, the first thing that this passage shows us is something that sadly we're all too familiar with, and that is that even Christians, you know, who have the Spirit and have the Word of God can still disagree on some things. Barnabas wanted to take John. By the way, he's also called Mark, and that's how he's referred to from this point forward on the second missionary journey. But Paul insisted that he not come because he had deserted them earlier in Pamphylia. Now, I think we need to acknowledge Paul did have a point, didn't he? I mean, Mark actually had abandoned the work, likely because he was young in the Lord. His faith had not yet grown to the point where he could draw the strength that he needed from the Lord Jesus Christ in order to endure every hardship. Now, Paul, I think, was thinking about what Jesus had said earlier in Luke 9, verse 62. No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, we know that certainly applies to those who begin to follow Jesus, you know, who seem to trust in Him, 
but then who turn back into the world. That person is not suitable for the kingdom. That person is not really a part of the kingdom. But it also applies to those who would begin to serve the Lord, but then abandon that service when things got tough. It can also refer to those who are not yet ready for service in the kingdom of heaven. And that appears to be the condition Mark was in, at least from Paul's perspective. Now, one thing we need to bear in mind is this, because that passage I just read from Jesus is rather austere, and perhaps it's frightened some of us at one time or another when we perhaps started moving in the right direction, and then we stopped, and we went the wrong direction, and false starts and so forth, we keep stopping. And the question is, if we do something like this, what is that actually saying about us when we set our hearts on serving the Lord? But then we fail or we give up. Well, I think there are a couple things we can learn from this, at least in the case of, of Mark. There's two things that we need to know. The first is that, thankfully, the Lord has said to each of us when we trusted Him, He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. If we love Him, which is the evidence that we have His Spirit in a saving way, he will hold on to us until the very end. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples regarding those whom the Father has given him. I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. That doesn't mean if they don't falter and they are absolutely perfect from this point forward. But he's saying what, regardless of what happens to them, regardless of what they do, they will never perish, and the reason is because the Lord will never let go of them. Paul wrote in Philippians 1.6, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So one of the things we can count on is even though we fail, and we all fail in many different ways, the Lord is not going to give up on us. The second thing we need to understand is this. The Lord will help us overcome our weaknesses and give us the strength to push forward. Have you ever asked yourself why it is that the Lord continually leads us into the kinds of situations that we have the most difficulty dealing with, where we most often fail? I mean, haven't you found that that is exactly the way the Lord works in your life? The reason is because He is giving us opportunities to grow to overcome those weaknesses with His strength. You see, we're never going to become stronger unless we actually learn to face our difficulties with the strength that He provides. That's, again, the whole purpose. And by the way, that's why we pray in the Lord's Prayer, do not lead us into temptation. Does the Lord lead us into temptation? Yes, He does. He allows that to take place. Why? So that we will face them and overcome them and so to pray that we would not be led in that direction is basically a prayer, Lord, help me to overcome my weaknesses so that I won't be tempted by these things. Now, Paul did not think that Mark had yet done this, that he had overcome his weakness. He thought he was too much of a risk. And so he insisted that he not come. But on the other hand, Barnabas, during the time that had passed, in which Mark also was basically having the Word of God poured into him, he thought he had grown past this point. And being the son of encouragement, as we know that he was, uh, that was his hope. He wanted to give Mark a second chance, the benefit of the doubt. He wanted him to be useful. You know that Mark also happened to be Barnabas' cousin. And that maybe gave him an even greater desire to see him succeed. In other words, Barnabas was for Mark, okay? It's always such an encouragement, isn't it? To have someone who believes in you. Somebody who is in your corner. Somebody who wants to see you do well. Well, that's what Barnabas was for Mark. And you know, the Scripture says that's really what we need to be for one another. We need to be encouragers and not you know, full-time critics. We, we need to learn to be sons and daughters of encouragement. Now, we do know that Mark eventually did succeed by God's grace. 
and probably through the encouragement of Barnabas as he took Mark under his wing and they continued to do the work of the Lord. And we're going to see more about that in just a few moments. But let's return to our point. Believers can have disagreements. Now, I don't need to tell you, but I will. You know, sometimes we disagree over doctrine, don't we? That's the reason why there's so many different denominations. Some, you know, we, we question, when is Jesus coming again? Is it before or after the millennium? And, and what really is the millennium? Uh, are things going to get better? Are things going to get worse before Jesus comes? We disagree over those things. We disagree over a number of things. We disagree over God's sovereignty and salvation. We disagree, as you know very well, over the status of children in the new covenant and just exactly what their position is. There, there are these disagreements. Sometimes we disagree over what the Scripture means by what it says in any particular verse. I think of perhaps my all-time favorite area. Uh, what does Paul mean about when he's talking about himself in Romans 7, verses 22 through 23? When he says, For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. What is Paul talking about here? Is he saying that he is a believer? I mean, he says he joyfully agrees with God's law. Can an unbeliever say that? Is he speaking as an unbeliever? He says he's still a prisoner of sin. Aren't believers freed? from their bondage to sin? Or is he saying about himself what Martin Lloyd-Jones believed, that he is an awakened unbeliever? <laughs> in other words, you know, he's still dead in trespass and sin, but now he's aware of his lost condition. The problem with that is it doesn't give you a love for the law of God. It only gives you a fear of God's judgment. So what does Paul mean? Well, again, there's disagreements. I'm not going to resolve that necessarily. Sometimes we disagree over what the Bible tells us to do morally, ethically. Uh, do we need to keep the Ten Commandments? There's a lot of evangelical Christians today who believe that that passed away with the Old Covenant. Now, if we do need to keep them, how do they apply? Are there changes between the Old Covenant and the New? For instance, do we still need to observe the Sabbath day? That's, that's an issue that divides even Reformed believers. But still, in other cases, there are divisions over matters of opinion, okay? Are this man and this woman ready to be married? Uh, you know, that's kind of a subjective thing. Is this man qualified to be an elder? Even if we see the, you know, the, the requirements in the Bible and know clearly what they are, we still have to evaluate the man with those, you know, against those requirements and see if he actually passes or fails. And I've noticed in a number of congregations, sometimes that scale seems like a sliding scale, depending upon what you have to work with in a particular congregation. Or in this particular case, is Mark now mature enough to do missionary work? Or does he still need time to grow? There are differences among believers. So the question is, how should we resolve these differences? Well, we know when it comes to differences in doctrine, we need to study everything the Bible has to say about any given particular truth and bring all the parts together so we can see the whole picture. When dealing with an individual passage, we need to study the words in their context, you know, the context of the sentence, the verse, the paragraph, the chapter, the book, the Bible. We need to see how this author uses these words in other contexts and, and these ideas to try to figure out what he means. The same is true when it comes to ethics. You know, what do we read in the Scripture? What examples does it give us? Um, how do we see things have changed between the Old Covenant and the New? What has changed? What has not changed? And you know what? Sometimes we can even take all the right steps and still disagree on the conclusion. I, I think of one historic example at the Marburg Colloquy, which um, you know, I think reveals something of Luther's weakness. Zwingli challenged Luther on his view of the real physical presence of Christ uh, 
in the Lord's Supper. Luther believed that the body and blood of Christ were in, with, around, that they were somehow added to the substance of the bread and the wine, whereas Zwingli said, no, they're not there at all. It's just the spiritual presence of Christ. And afterwards, uh, Oikolampadius, which is quite an interesting name, who was basically the companion of Zwingli, uh, his, his um, uh, additional theologian who was there to help him and his side, and Melanchthon, who was basically Luther's first on, on his side, or his second, you might say, they could barely convince Luther that Zwingli could even be a Christian because he denied that particular doctrine. So even though you have the greatest minds of the Reformation meeting together at that particular time, they still could not come to an agreement because they understood these things differently. And again, that's why we have so many denominations of Christians today. We just don't seem to be able to see things in the same way. And why is that? Ultimately, because of sin. You know, we are all defective in some way. We all do not see things the way we should see them. Now, matters of opinion are even more difficult, aren't they, as I've already pointed out. And here we have one that isn't resolved. Paul thought John wasn't ready. Barnabas believed he was ready. Which of them was right? Well, you know, we're really not sure. But we do know this, that their disagreement was so strong that it caused them to go their separate ways. We read that Barnabas took Mark and he sailed to Cyprus. You know, remember that Cyprus is where the first missionary journey began. So they began to retrace the initial steps of the first missionary journey in order to see how the churches were doing there. Paul took Silas and he traveled north towards Derby and Lystra, taking the land route rather than the sea route to get again to the places where they had been before to see how the new churches were faring. Now, some point to the fact that since Luke tells us that Paul and Silas were committed to God's grace by the brethren and not Barnabas and Mark, doesn't say that, and that he traces the progress of Paul and Silas, but not that of Barnabas and Mark, that Paul was in the right and Barnabas was in the wrong. But again, it's really, it's hard to say. We do know that um, they later appear to be reconciled. We see Paul defending Barnabas in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, that Barnabas has the right to get his living from the gospel that he proclaims. And by the way, 1 Corinthians was written on the third missionary journey. We're talking about the beginning of the second. So did Paul write Barnabas off? No. He still saw him as a brother in the Lord Jesus. He still defended him. And at the end of Paul's life, he writes about Mark in 2 Timothy 4.11. Remember, 2 Timothy was written just before Paul's martyrdom. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. And let's not forget, this is the same Mark that wrote the gospel by that name. So even though they had this disagreement, it did not end their friendship. It did not end their fellowship. They still saw each other as brothers and fellow workers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sadly, today, disagreements between those who profess Christ seldom seem to end in reconciliation. More often than not, it's irreconcilable. And that's why we need to pray that we don't become a part of that, that we don't become the one who is unwilling to be reconciled to that brother or sister in the Lord. We need to pray that God would give us the grace to do what needs to be done to prevent that. Exactly what Peter tells us in our memory verse, 1 Peter 4, verse 8. He says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, that has to happen, as we also see in 1 Corinthians 13, so that we might, as Paul tells us, Preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's not forget when Jesus prayed the high priestly prayer and he said that they may be one, even as, as Jesus said that he and the Father were one, that they might be one in love. He wasn't talking just about the disciples who were present at that time. He was talking about everyone who would believe in him, that we would all be one, even as they are one, that we would all have this love for one another. 
Now, obviously, if we don't have that love, we're not going to have that unity. And that is the reason why we do not see it today. We need to remember that Satan is working very hard. Our flesh is also working very hard to divide us. But the Spirit is working strongly to unite us together in love. Our Lord tells us we need to resist the devil. and He will flee from us. We need to put the desires of our flesh to death. We need to fight against those. We need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be filled with this Holy Spirit. We need to yield to God's Spirit as He leads us in the path of love. And if we do that, we will find that there's going to be far less division and far more unity in the body. Our Lord prayed for unity. He desires unity. We need to be working towards that rather than letting the divisions stand. Well, may the Lord give us grace to do that. Let's, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer. And as we're praying, let's just also think about divisions that, that we may have with brethren that maybe we haven't attempted to reconcile. Our Lord tells us that even before we come to worship Him, if we remember that there is somebody who has something against us, we need to go to them and we need to seek to be reconciled to them. If we have and we have, we've failed, there's nothing we can do about that except continue to pray and hope. But if we haven't, we still need to deal with it. So if there are any unresolved things of that nature, we should pray about those before we come to the table. Let's take just a moment and pray.